Hey everyone, and welcome back to Country Music Made Me. Thank you so much for joining us once again. If you haven't already, please be sure to check out our website, countrymusicmademe.com. There you can listen to all of our episodes and also sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content like very special acoustic performances from past and upcoming guests, as well as staying up to date on all of our upcoming guests. Just head over to countrymusicmademe.com and hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on any streaming platform. So if streaming is your thing, just head over to your favorite, search Country Music Made Me and give us a follow there as well. On today's episode, we are excited to welcome Canadian up and coming artist, Devin Cooper. Now, Devin started playing the guitar at age seven. He started to sing and play in bands in his teens. And in 2018, he left his day job to pursue a career in music. He recently released his debut EP, Good Things, and he is set for big things this summer. So please enjoy our conversation with Devin Cooper. Let's start at two years old. And I read something about uh, you cranking up the Beatles CD in your parents' home. And that was sort of the start of your love of music. Now, do you remember back then like when do your memories kick in from having a very vivid memory of when music really started to touch you and really started to make you feel stuff inside well it's interesting because my we had like one of those home video cameras like a big vhs whatever massive thing so right, yeah i think my memories get confused with watching myself because we have so much video of me when i'm younger and i almost feel like i remember those moments so i don't know if i remember them or if i just like have watched it so many times that I like know what the feeling was like. Right. Yeah. But I remember being, I might've been just like, yeah, two years old. And we had one of those big like stereos that everybody had back in the day with the big tall speakers, tower speakers. And we had the Beatles anthology CD. And I just remember putting it in and turning up the song day tripper and just cranking it as loud as it would go. And that like opening guitar riff and it just right. like captivated me. And then my mom also had like a Yamaha Clavinova piano that could also like play itself. You could put like this book in it and it would like play a song and teach it to you. Oh, okay. And I remember putting on this like, it was like a 12 bar blues boogie song or something like that. And you could turn the keys off so you could just like play along and it wouldn't make sound. Yeah. And there's a bunch of videos of me playing along to it and like bobbing my head and stuff. And I was maybe like a year and a half at that point. Oh, really? Wow. Maybe just two. And it was like... Uh, you could tell that there was a bug there from, uh, from the start. <laughs> That's great. And now your mom was in the healthcare field. Your dad worked on custom cars, custom motorcycles. So within the musicality of it, I know they played music. Like your dad was always cranking music in the shop, but as far as that love of actually doing it and actually performing and that part of it, do you know where that came from? Is there any other family members who had that love and passion for music in the same way? There's uh, I have a few cousins and things like that. And a couple of uncles that have like played over the years, but uh, there was nothing that, uh, Nothing in my direct family in terms of like my mom, dad, grandpa kind of thing, grandparents, uh, that was like a direct correlation of like, that's where that came from. Right. Everybody always loved music. Um, my grandma says, uh, she couldn't carry a tune if it was in a box. And, uh, there's just like, everybody loves music, but nobody just like really played it. My dad played piano growing up. He, uh, took like eight years of Royal Conservatory piano. Oh, wow. And, uh, but never like could play. He could always read the music and play the notes, but never could like just play. Oh, and that was okay. like, it kind of, uh, got to the point where he was like, this isn't something that I can do. I can learn how to do it and like follow what I'm supposed to do, but I can't just like feel it and do it. So, uh, I think a lot of people have maybe tried, but no one has, uh, it all built up and I got it all. Right. Yeah, exactly. And now one of your other loves and passion, I believe, is golf. And one of your grandpas, your papa, you call him, I believe, got you your first putter when you were two years old. Now talk about him and just the inspiration that he's been, not necessarily musically, 
but just as a person throughout this journey, because I know you still hit the golf course with him, I believe. Yeah, we're actually going golfing for the first time this year, right after this podcast. Oh, nice. So That's awesome. I'm I'm, uh, I'm excited for that. We haven't been able to get out this year yet, so that'll be fun. But yeah, from the time I was a little kid, uh, like I've been super close with my grandparents my whole life on both sides, mom and dad's side. So this is my dad's dad. Oh, okay. And uh, growing up, he was he was a big golfer, and so when I was like two years old, like you said. He got me my first putter. It was a cut down short little putter and took me out to the golf course just to start kind of whacking balls around. And uh, I think I got my first membership in Innisfail when I was like five, excuse me, five years old. And he used to pick me up every day after school in the summer and we'd go play nine holes. Oh, nice. And so every day after school in the summer, we'd go golfing. Every day after school in the winter, he'd pick me up and we'd go curling. And then <laughs> uh, when my mom was working or... Uh, my dad was working on bikes and cars and stuff like that, gave me something to do in the afternoon. And then, uh, yeah, it's just kind of been one of those things that I think learning how to golf and learning how to do those things, it has taught me a lot of patience because it's one of those things that you can't rush. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that that has been, uh, probably a pretty important, uh, life lesson along the journey, like you said, and, uh, just learning how to take the time to learn something and have the patience to be able to get through it. Right. Yeah. And so when it came to guitar, when you hit, I believe it was five years old and you started begging your parents for a guitar around that time at that age, did you have the patience? Like, were you thinking I want a guitar because I want to learn it. I want to take the time. Or were you thinking I want a guitar so I can shred? I think every kid when they get a guitar wants to shred. Um, and obviously I had enough patience and persistence to uh, beg and save money for two years till I was able to save up enough money to buy one. And then uh, my parents ended up buying me one for, for Christmas. But I think it's uh, one of those things, just all those little things and every, every little lesson that you have kind of teaches you the patience and uh, dedication and how to, uh, when you want something, doesn't always happen right away, but you got to work for it. Right. I think I was, I think I was fortunate enough to learn that very early on. And so you did save up for two years, but then you come down on Christmas and you see that guitar sitting there or it's wrapped up and then you unwrap it. Now, what was that moment like for you as a seven-year-old who's wanted this for two years, who has worked so hard to get it and there it is finally in front of you. What was that moment like? It was pretty unbelievable. It was, uh, it was like the coolest gift I could ever ask for at the time and probably still is, would be the coolest gift if I walked out and there was a new guitar sitting there for me. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, it was just one of those things. It's like, I've been, I've been saving and wanting this for so long and I could finally, I had enough money to buy something out of like the Sears catalog and then to actually come out to like a real electric guitar and amp and everything sitting there. It was, uh, it was literally life-changing. <laughs> yeah. And is that guitar still around? Is it still within your collection or at your parents' house? I do still have it. Yeah. It's not here. I don't have room for it on this rack. I have another rack at my parents' house still that is uh, full of all my other guitars. And so how many do you have? What does your collection entail these days? I don't even know my the number count. I think it's probably like 13 or 14. Oh, I wow. Would have to, I would have to sit and think about it. There's how many here? Two, four, six eight there and then there's probably there's eight there i got some in the other room and then probably five or six or seven more at my parents house <laughs> and so that love of not only playing but also just guitars is there sort of two areas of your brain that you have one where you love just the guitar part of it and maybe what a guitar means to you and the other side of it where it's the musicality of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a bit of crossover in the middle too, because I think the cool part about all of the different guitars is they all sound different. They all play a little different. They all feel a little different. They're all made with like a piece of wood out of the forest. And it's like, basically you take a chance, you have these two pieces of wood and you put them together and you hope that they resonate properly. You hope that they create sound the way that you want them to. And it's really interesting to hear how different guitars of different woods 
sound different, play different, work different, and then how different shapes and sizes and looks and different types of finishes make them sound different. And I think that also goes back to like the custom car and bike building that I grew up watching is like, it's like an art piece. Each different one can like tell a story just by looking at it. Right. And so when you're looking at a guitar, what makes you say, I want that guitar? Is it the look? Is it the history? Is it the maker? Like, what do you take into account when you say, I want to add this to my collection? I think it's all of those things. I think, obviously, initially the look. It's like if something catches your eye, you're like, oh, what's that? Instantly intrigued. Right. And then I've actually, one of the guitars here, there was uh, two of the exact same guitars hanging at the music store. And I went in, played one of them, and it was like, oh, this is horrible. This is does not play good. I love the look of it, but it just plays horrible. Put it back on the shelf. Then I look, and there's like the exact same guitar, same color, everything right beside it. So I pick it up, play it, and it's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Like, this is, this is the nicest guitar I've ever played. Instantly bought it. But it's crazy how something like that, it's like they're the exact same thing, but maybe they're wood from different trees or made by different people or whatever. And it's like, so the look catches you at first. And then I think it's just how it feels in your hands. Like, does it feel right? Can you like extend yourself to be part of the guitar? Right. And now I saw you mention, I think it was at 10 years old, a honey blonde 2006 60th anniversary Fender Stratocaster highway one. Now, was that one of your first guitars after the one that you had gotten for Christmas? Yeah, that was the first guitar I bought. Uh, I proceeded to save up all my money again after I got my first guitar. And uh, I bought that one when I was nine years old, I guess. Okay. And spent every penny I had on it. It was like 800 bucks or something at oh, the time. Wow. And uh, yeah, I still have it. Actually, it is this one here. Oh, nice. So it's getting some wear on it now from playing it for so many years. But uh it's, uh, it's kind of my number one. Right. And so what does that, what does it mean to you now? But also what did it mean to you back then? As like you say, the first one you bought, you saved up for so long. I mean, $800 as a nine-year-old, that's a lot of money. So what was that feeling like when you were able to do that? It was, it was really cool. Cause it was a guitar I'd dreamed about owning for a long time. A couple of my favorite guitar players that I'd looked up to had also played blonde strats and it was like i want to find a blonde strat that's just like what i want and they're not super common there's a lot of blonde telecasters but there's not a lot of blonde strats and i remember walking into the music store in red deer that was the store we always went to and all of a sudden there it was hanging on the wall and i was like i have to get it like i've never seen one before i've only ever seen these like people that i idolized when i was younger play them right and so it was like go home, scrounge up every penny I could possibly find. And I think I actually had to borrow like 150 bucks from my parents to make it happen. Oh, and really? I had to pay them back afterwards. <laughs> but it was really cool because it was, uh, again, it was one of those things that I'd really wanted for a long time and had saved up for and just, I never thought I was going to find it. And then there it was. <laughs> That's awesome. And so when you first picked up the guitar, like at seven, when you got that guitar for Christmas and you started taking lessons, how quickly did you take to it? Was it something that came fairly natural for you or did you have to work pretty hard at it to actually get somewhere off the beginning? I think I worked really hard, but it's because I wanted to. So it came easy because I wanted, like it was something I wanted so bad that I like, I wouldn't let it not come easy. But right, my guitar teacher, the first one, he, uh, he said, I've never taught someone that's seven years old, like, Normally seven year olds don't have the attention span or capacity to kind of like learn how to play an instrument like this. Right. And I think it was after the first or second lesson, he's like, I'll do two weeks of lessons for free, no charge. Like, let's just see how it is. And if he, if he seems like it's something that he could maybe do, then uh, we'll look at like taking him on for lessons and otherwise he can come back in a few years kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And so we did the first two lessons and after the first two lessons, my guitar teacher was like, kids got it. Like, I don't know what it is. I've never, he's like, this is unbelievable. He's like, I want to teach him every week. So we started <laughs> doing weekly lessons and that was, uh, that was the start of it. Wow. And are you still in contact with him? Yeah, actually we, uh, we hadn't been in contact for about 
probably 10 years or so, 10 or 12 years, um, as life changes and people move on and move different yeah. places or whatever. And, uh, recently we actually just like reconnected over Facebook and kind of been chatting a little bit, which has been pretty cool. That's awesome. And on the singing side, when did that start to kick in for you? Was that also at a young age that you started to sing or did that come a bit later after you started playing the guitar and realizing you wanted to sort of put those two things together? It was a little bit later. I was, uh, I was about 14 when I started singing and I had actually started writing songs. And at that point, it's like, if I'm going to write these songs, I guess I should sing them. Right. And what happened was, is I'd written like five or six songs or maybe 10 songs. And I decided that I was going to record an album. And I was like, well, if I'm going to record an album, I better learn how to sing. <laughs> then I, uh, cause I had these songs and I wanted to record them. And so I started taking vocal lessons and actually had to jump around between a bunch of different vocal coaches because all of them tried to get me to do all these things that could never like resonate with me. And it was never something that would uh, like put me on the right track to singing how I wanted to sing and how right. I needed to learn. There was nothing that would like connect with me. And then I finally got one teacher uh, out of Sylvan Lake and she was like, do you normally play guitar? And I was like, yeah. She's like, well, bring your guitar. And then she was able to realize that like when I played guitar, then I could sing. Cause it was almost like I could pitch match and like match the note that I'm playing on my guitar. Whereas if I was just like free singing in the air, trying to do it, it's like, I couldn't connect. It didn't make sense with what I was trying to do at the time. Right. And yeah. So it took like probably four or five different vocal coaches till we found this one. And it was, it was actually getting kind of frustrating at the time because it's like, I want to do this and nobody's able to help or like, they're just like going by the book. And right, it's like, yeah. sometimes, sometimes by the book doesn't work. <laughs> and so at 14, when you're thinking, I want to record music, was that because you want to record music because you wanted this to be like your life? Or back then, was it just like, I want to do it because it's fun and my heroes did it. So I want to do it. I think I always wanted it to be my life. I don't know if I always thought I would pursue it when I was younger. I think that it was something that I always wanted. Um, but I think that that is just with like a young age. Sometimes you're nervous or scared about like things. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm 14 and I'm in high school or junior high or whatever I'm in 15. Um, I can't really go pursue this right now. Social media wasn't near as big a thing as it is now. Right. Yeah. And it's like, well, I guess I'll just keep practicing and playing. And if, and I was in a band in high school, like a rock band. and we, we played shows around and had a lot of fun and stuff, but I knew that that wasn't what I was going to do. I knew that the rock band thing wasn't going to be it. Um, so that's kind of when I started writing my own songs and, and doing my own thing and ended up playing a couple solo acoustic shows. And it was like, oh, like this is this is it. This is what I'm doing. <laughs> and so what was it about the rock band that didn't necessarily draw you in because I saw that your dad like classic rock was really what he was pumping in his garage and so when you got to that high school age and felt that rock wasn't really the way like what was the feeling with inside of you where were you being drawn to I think it wasn't well I think it was two things I think rock music I I love rock music I'll always be a rock fan I'm wearing a Rolling Stones t-shirt uh but there was something about songs that told stories that could like resonate with you and something about a song that could like make you feel something that always hit me. And I found in rock, we were getting less and less of that. Right. And it was more just like words that sound cool together, which I mean is great because they obviously sell millions of records, but it wasn't, it didn't resonate with me as much as it had previously done uh, growing up. And so I think I was kind of always like, writing country music because it's the story it's like that emotional story whether that's like to have a good time or to help you get through something like whatever it is it was the the storytelling aspect and then also in the rock band it's like three egos all fighting each other right, trying yeah. to figure out <laughs> who's going to be the front man and who's going to do whatever and i just like i didn't want to play i didn't want to i didn't want to fight that fight it wasn't worth it it's like, right. I'll just, I'll do my own thing. I'll find my own people and we'll like, then I can just kind of do what, what I want to do. And I can find the right people along the way to kind of help support that. Yeah, absolutely. And I believe it was, 
what, 2013, around the age of 16, when you recorded your first EP. And so at that age, how did you sort of get into that? Did you just sort of make calls to local studios to try and find someone? Or did you have connections through somebody else? Or how did that all come about at at the young age of 16? Yeah, well, my best friend growing up, his brother actually owned a studio in Calgary. Oh, okay. And so I reached out to him and we had a meeting and chatted about it and I told him what I wanted to do and I actually played all of the instruments on the record so I played the drums bass piano guitar oh, really like did everything oh wow and uh he uh he still has a studio in Calgary actually he cuts all like the the master recordings for vinyls and stuff like that for a bunch of major label acts in the U.S. and you know oh, okay. does a bunch of really cool stuff so he's still in it doing it but I uh reached out to him and told him what I wanted to do and said I wanted to do uh, five songs, and he was like, "Well, let's plan for four because it's a lot of work to get five songs done, kind of thing." Right. And yeah. So we booked uh, three days in the studio, and so we went in. And on the second day, he was like, "We're making pretty good time. Like, we can do that fifth song if you want." Banged out the fifth song, and then he was like, "We've still got time. I don't know if you have anything else." So then I came up with like an instrumental on the spot, which ended up being the title track of the record. So it ended up being a six song EP. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, is no longer available anywhere, anywhere online. You will never find it anywhere. And, uh, I think I have like 30 copies left in my basement. (laughs) That's awesome. And so was it like country rock leaning music or what was that first EP? Was it all over the place? (laughs) It was a little all over the place, but it was pretty bluesy. It was like blues rock kind of thing, but okay. still that like storytelling aspect in all of the lyrics that if you stripped it down to just an acoustic guitar and a vocal, it could probably get away as country music. <laughs> and so when did it sort of start to change and move more into the country genre for you and incorporating more of that bluesy rock sound, but then bringing in more country to it? I probably would have been about 18 years old. I was, I moved to Calgary, was going to state for college and I still hadn't really like listened to a lot of country music. And I didn't really know that I liked country music even at that time, but I just knew that I liked storytelling songs and a song that like hits you. But my car I was driving was a 76 Oldsmobile and it only had an AM radio. And the only station I could get was the AM country station in Calgary. And so driving back and forth to school, that's all I could listen to. Right. Every day back and forth for a year, that's all I listened to. And that like really opened my eyes as like, oh, there's actually like a ton of diversity in the country music genre that um, isn't necessarily like all of the stereotypical stuff that you hear when you don't grow up in the country music genre. Yeah, exactly. And uh, then I was, it was maybe six months later, something like that. I was uh, asked to go to a concert with a friend of mine and he was like, I think you'll really like this concert. It's at Cowboys, the country bar in Calgary. And I was like, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I just, it's not my thing. Right. Yeah. And he was like, no, I really think you'll like these guys. Like, I think, I think you'll really like it. And I was like, fine. Who is it? He's like, okay, it's one guy. His name's Kip Moore. And then another band called the Cadillac three. And I was like, I don't know who either of those people are. I don't want to go. And I was just like, I fought this so hard. For some reason, I didn't want to go to the show. I don't know what it was. Right. <clears throat> and actually, the two days, I'll back up a little bit. I was in the studio recording, doing a demo with uh, one of the guys who's now one of my producers and uh, also plays my band and another friend of mine. And they were both in the country genre and they were playing for Brett Kissel at the time. Okay. Yeah. I still wasn't doing country. I was still kind of doing like the bluesy rock thing. Right. And um, so the first day after the studio, we go to this concert at night. Finally, he convinces me to go. He's like, I got tickets. We're going to go. I'll pay for your ticket. Perfect. So we go down to the show, go to the doors and the tickets are like those complimentary tickets that you get that are only good till 8 p.m. Like you have to be in the bar before eight. Oh, okay. Like 8.30. And it's like, well, now we have to buy tickets. I was like, I'm not buying a ticket. I'm not <laughs> spending, I'm not buying a ticket. And he's like, fine, I'll buy your ticket. So he pays for my ticket to go to the show. We go on the show, Cadillac three walkouts, like three long haired dudes. Looks like, like a modern ZZ top kind of thing. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. And they like hit the first note of the set. And I'm like, 
like this can be country like i didn't know that <laughs> played the they played their set i was just blown away kip moore comes out just like cool looking guy wearing like an indian motorcycle t-shirt played his whole set and that show literally changed my life from like that day forward it's like okay now i know where i'm supposed to go wow that's amazing. And Spencer Cheney, I believe, was one of those guys, the guy that you were working in the studio with, I think. It was uh, it was actually Justin Cutting, so the bass oh, okay. player. Oh, okay. And a uh, little, uh, little bit after that, he introduced me to Spencer Cheen. And uh, we have uh, been working together pretty much since then. We uh, actually met Justin in 2015. I won a rock radio contest in Olds, a small town just next over from ours. Oh, okay. And he was hired as the studio bass player to come in and record on the track that the radio station paid for. And that's how we ended up meeting. And then just kind of like carried on that uh, conversation. And I had a chance to go back in the studio again. And he was kind of the only like session bass player I knew. It was him and Ben Bradley were the two people that were called in for the session who were both playing for Brett at the time. And <laughs> uh, then, uh, yeah, just kind of went from there. It's crazy how like winning a rock radio contest when you're 17 can turn into uh, a friendship seven, eight years later. And Justin's the musical director of my band and plays all the shows with me and also is one of the co-producers on the record and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, and that's what I was going to ask. Like, I mean, that early in your career, working with Justin, working with Spencer, um, you mentioned Ben Bradley. So when you're jumping into the studio at that young age with these musicians, did you understand it? Like, Not did you all. know what was going on? I had no idea the caliber of players and like how good of people these guys were when I first met them. I knew they were good guys and I knew they were good players because they came into the session and they played for an hour and a half and were like, we're done recording. And that was it. And I was like, that's it? Like now I just like play guitar and sing and then we're done. Like that's it. And, uh, but I had no idea like at the, the caliber of musicians that they were at the time when I first met them. Right. And so in January of 2018, I believe it was, you made your first trip down to Nashville. Now, was it because of those guys? And I also saw that Brad Saunders is another part of that crew that I believe you met back in that day. So is it that group? that sort of helped you get down to Nashville for those first trips? Yeah, it was. It was, uh, there's kind of a, a small group of us that had started hanging out and going to like the Country Music Alberta Awards and things like that. And um, Spencer and Justin, all those guys had obviously been in it longer than us. So they were the guys that we were looking up to trying to hang out with them. Right. And uh, it was actually after, um, I think it was, the second country music Alberta awards that I'd ever been to. Maybe the first one, actually we flew to Nashville right after that. And it was myself, Spencer Cheen, Brad Saunders, Aaron Pollock, and uh, Ruben Young, who's like an R and B artist, friend of ours from Calgary. And the five of us hopped on a plane at 3 AM and flew to Nashville. <laughs> and I had no rights lined up. I didn't have anything going on. All these guys had been there multiple times, except for Ruben. Ruben had never been there. And, uh, I was like, I'll just go and figure it out and try and meet people and try and whatever. And if I get one right, great. If I don't get any rights, then I guess what I'll just, I got to go. I got to figure out and see what it's like. Right. And I ended up having one, one co-write outside of the house. And other than that, we just, uh, I wrote with the guys in the evening in the house when they got back and I just kind of went around, checked out a bunch of coffee shops, tried to, uh, meet as many people as I could. And just was that young stars my eyes super green trying to run around a new city and see what's going on and did you understand what nashville meant i mean not growing up in country music and not really diving into country music until a year or two before that did you understand sort of how important nashville is within this career and what it meant to be down there yeah at that point i did i'd i'd started co-writing a lot um probably in 20 2016 i'll say i started um, like really diving into writing and co-writing and had written a ton of songs with a lot of people around Calgary. And then I knew that all of the hit writers were basically in Nashville. So it's like, well, I need to write enough songs that I can become a proficient enough writer that I can at least reach out to these people and see if I can book a writer, meet them. Or when I meet them at the CCMAs or meet them at the Country Music Alberta Awards, then it's like, 
I have something to show kind of thing for, for the work that I've done and can at least like talk shop and feel a little less intimidated when I walk into the room with them. <laughs> and now I think I saw that one of your last trips, you wrote with Carolyn Don Johnson. Now, is that one of your biggest rights that you've had down in Nashville? Or are there some others that kind of mix in with that that are pretty big for you? No, that would probably be one of the biggest. And it's actually cool. I, uh, I ended up staying at her place when I was down there. Oh, and really? We've since become friends, which is pretty cool. And I've, I've been able to stay there a couple of times. I was in there. I was there last October and we stayed there for a month. And it was, uh, she's just one of the most amazing people in the world, just heart of gold. And uh, to be able to sit and write with her and just like hear her sing and sit there and play guitar and play piano. And it's just unbelievable. And so going down there for a month, you've traveled back and forth over the last few years. And like you say, your last trip was about a month. So as you go down there more, is there any thought to move down there at some point? Yeah, I think I'd really like to live down in the States somewhere. I don't know if Nashville's it. I want to, I want to check out a bunch of different places. We, we went to Muscle Shoals for a day in Alabama, and that was really cool. There's a really cool vibe in that town. And uh, I want to check out Austin. I hear they got a really cool music scene. Kind right. of see what's going on in Texas. And I think that Nashville probably makes the most sense to be the hub, but uh, I want to check out a bunch of different places. And also you can drive around all year long there and tour and play a bunch of shows and not get stuck in minus 40 with 10 feet of snow. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, a little, that's nice too. <laughs> that's awesome. And now let's take a trip back to September 1st, 2018 at 4 p.m. You walk out of your day job for the last time to pursue music as a career. What was that moment like for you? It's pretty nerve wracking. I had got out of college, I think a year and a bit before that. And I, the day I got out of college, I said to my dad, I'm not going to get a job. I just want to pursue music. And he's like, well, you still got bills to pay. So you got to figure out a way to make money till you can go pursue it full time. So I worked at Napa all through high school and then was fortunate enough to be able to go back there for a job after college and kind of work there six days a week and then play shows every night. And it was basically building up to the point where I had enough shows that I could make enough money to move to Calgary and still pay my rent, still pay all those things and not have to rely on the day job income to kind of make that happen. And right, yeah. so it got to the point where I was able to play enough shows and I just, I, my boss was unbelievable. He'd give me any day off I needed, no matter what. And uh, to this day, if I needed a job, I could walk back in there and I'd pretty much have a job guaranteed. So it's, uh, it was, it was nice knowing that when I left there, if something went real wrong, I could probably go back. Um, but it was, it was definitely scary. I was supposed to work harvest for a farmer just outside of town. And that was, I was going to work that all of September to October 1st. And that was going to kind of set me up for the winter so that no matter what, my rent was paid, everything was paid for. Right, yeah. I have enough money to go through. And the day I quit my job, I got a phone call saying they didn't need me anymore. Oh, really? And it was like my whole like winter reserve was gone. And it was like, okay, now the real work starts. And I ended up just gigging a whole bunch. I got a gig at the Calgary airport, uh, like busking in the mornings. And I would literally roll nickels and dimes and quarters on my living room floor when I moved to Calgary. And uh, take them to the bank so I could pay rent. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a grind. <laughs> so was there any point within the first year or two after you moved to Calgary that you were like, nope, can't do it. Got to move home. This isn't going to work. No, I think I'm too stubborn to let that happen. I also was, I was really fortunate. The house that I moved into was uh, a musical house that I'd actually been trying to move into for a couple of years and just a spot hadn't opened up. And it was uh, Maddie McKay, who uh, is the four or five time CCMA guitar player of the year. Uh, Adam Dowling, who's drummer for George Canyon and a million other artists. Oh, and, wow. Uh, Aaron Pollock, who's a fantastic songwriter from Calgary. And so it was the three of them that were in the house and Maddie had just got engaged. So he was moving out, but he still had a studio there. So there's a studio in the house so all these musicians there and it was like whenever you felt down it's like you just open your bedroom door and listen and there's something happening in the house whether that's like a record being cut in the garage beside me on the other side of the wall or whether it's like someone writing downstairs or like maddie sitting in the living room playing guitar just like hanging out having a coffee or whatever 
and uh, there was no shortage of inspiration to uh, to keep me going. That's for sure. So, do you think if you would have just moved into your own place, just a studio apartment in downtown Calgary, it would have led to the same place you are today? Probably not, because I think that all of those those three people, especially, have been incredibly instrumental in uh, kind of making this whole thing happen and uh, helping along each step of the way, whether that's like living with a great songwriter and writing songs every day or like just watching Maddie play guitar or sitting in the studio with Adam late at night, drinking wine, learning about the studio and how things work. And um, it's uh, living in that house was definitely like a life changing experience. Right. And now, like you talk about 2019, you gigged as much as you could. I mean, I saw that you played, what, 23 shows in 10 days at the Stampede, the Calgary Stampede in 2019. You're a part of Project Wild. Um, 2020 was being set up for a great year. You're going to be playing the Coca-Cola stage at Stampede at Rock and River Fest. And then everything shuts down. So as a young artist who's just on their way up, what did that shutdown mean for you? Well, it was interesting. I think I had a little bit of a different outlook on it than most people because I had flown back from Nashville and had actually gone in and done a liver transplant with my dad. Right. And I knew that I was going to be out of commission for like four months. So leading, like I'd kind of for the year leading up to that, I didn't know when it was going to happen or if it was going to happen or if it was even able to happen, but I had like, prepped knowing that if if this happens it's four months off no matter what like no matter what i have to recover that's it right and then when i got the phone call that we were going to do the transplant it's like okay well i'm off for four months now that's it so i called canceled all my gigs for the next four months and then literally three weeks later the world shut down after the transplant had happened and so i was in the headspace that i'm out for four months anyways so everyone was like two weeks what are we going to do and i think that uh, I was very fortunate to have already like prepped to be out for four months. Right, uh, yeah. I was not prepped to be out for two years, but I was prepped for the first four months at least. <laughs> and now let's talk about that liver transplant. Talk about that experience with your dad and being a live organ donor and basically being able to help save his life. It was pretty crazy. I still, uh, I still don't think it's really hit me of what actually happened, even though we're over two years after it's happened it's uh it was one of those things that it was just like everything was kind of a blur at the time and it was uh i'd found out in may 2019 that he had uh liver cancer and it was just kind of like a luck of the draw thing just like one of those things you just get cancer kind of thing yeah and uh at that point i was like bound and determined whatever i have to do i'm going to be a donor i was like i don't know or not even a donor i'm just like i'm going to fix this i don't know how and my dad's like well you can't like that's that's nice of you to think that but you can't so i was on google research and everything and i found out that you could be a liver donor but there was it was significantly more difficult than like a kidney or other things like that um because 40 percent of people die waiting for a liver transplant and 40 percent of people are not eligible to donate a liver because it doesn't match due to the um, anatomy of the liver and the size of it and how the basically the plumbing works in the liver and and all that stuff. So um, it was like eight months of my dad going through tests and trials and all that kind of stuff to figure out what exactly they needed. And then when he was able to get onto the donor list, then I could put myself up voluntarily to be a donor. And he couldn't say no to that because... Uh, he doesn't have a choice. I'm volu- voluntarily putting myself up and him and my mom definitely did not want me to do it at the time. Oh, wow. Um, being the only kid, they didn't want me to put my life on hold kind of thing. And right, I was like, yeah. it doesn't matter, whatever, I'll do whatever. And so I was supposed to have like a mock-up kind of thing for uh, like MRIs and blood tests and all that kind of work at the end of February, 2020. And I was in Nashville at the start of February and got a phone call from the hospital actually in the middle of writing the song good things oh, wow. and they said there's been a cancellation uh we're able to move up your blood work and testing and all that stuff to find out if you're an eligible candidate to next monday 
And I was like, will that affect the potential outcome of a transplant date? And they were like, nope, not at all. They're like, there's way too many variables. It's at least six months away. And I was like, okay. And I was like, wait, so you're telling me there's no chance that it could change anything. Like two weeks won't change anything at all. And they're like, well, we're not supposed to tell you this, but the following Monday after that, there's been a cancellation in the operating room. And if you are a candidate and it will actually work, there's a chance that we could get you in. It would be two weeks from now. And I, but they're like, there's so many variables that are unknown that, um, there's no way we can commit to that. Cause like I said, 40% of people are denied based on just the anatomy of it. And then you have right. to go through like social worker questions and stuff like that. Are you able to support yourself for the next few months while you're out of commission kind of thing? And, or have you been coerced into doing this and all that kind of stuff? And, uh, which I obviously was not. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it, uh, so I changed my flight. I actually wrote with Carolyn Don Johnson in the morning, in the morning, flew back the Monday afternoon and, uh, drove to Edmonton overnight and spent there three days there doing all the MRIs and mock-ups and blood tests and whatever. And at the end of the three days, it would have been Thursday morning. I think they said, all right, well, we've done everything and you are a potential, you are a candidate. So you could do this. Um, if you want to do it, we can do it Monday morning. And this is Thursday. And we're like, just unbelievable that it happened like that. Wow. We come home. I played gigs Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday we went back to Edmonton, booked into a hotel across the street, and Monday morning went in for the operation. And uh, yeah, now here we are just over two years later. I'm healthy. My dad's healthy, cancer-free. Everything's pretty much perfect. So, Wow. And you've always had a strong bond with your dad, but that did that strengthen it even more? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Uh, it's just, I don't know. It's one of those things that words can't even really describe how, uh, how it feels or, uh, how it impacted our relationship, but it's, uh, it's definitely in a very positive way <laughs> impacted our relationship. And did it impact you as an artist within your songwriting and with your artist career when you came out of that experience? Yeah, I think that it was a long year leading up to that point, And it was like, it was uh, definitely like a lot of s struggles leading up to it of like, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. Like it, if he gets sicker, he could, he could die before I am able to do it. Or like, we don't, we don't know what the outcome could be. And it's just like it kind of reinforced uh, appreciating the journey and like appreciating each little milestone that you, you have along the way and to not take anything for granted. And then, especially because coming out of that, the world shuts down and it's like, uh, if the, if the surgery had been pushed two weeks, it would have not happened. And right. Then yeah. All elective surgeries were canceled. And so it just, I think it, it gave me some, uh, some clarity on slowing down and appreciating the moments in life. <laughs> wow. And so the two years that followed just the shutdown and not being able to play and as an artist basically being stuck within your career what did that mean for you because i talked to a lot of artists who off the beginning it was really difficult but now that we're sort of coming out of it they've realized it was actually somewhat of a good thing and they were able to find themselves more as a musician because they had time to stop and really do some inward thinking so was that similar for you yeah absolutely i think I, uh, I hate sitting around, so I always try and find something to do to keep me busy. And for the three years leading up to that point, I'd written so many songs, played so many shows, but I'd kind of taken a break on recording because I wanted to figure out who I was, write enough songs to figure out what's the direction I want to go, play enough shows to figure out like, well, what's the voice I need to have moving forward. So then it gave me a chance to sit down and look at everything that I'd done for the past two years and figure out what we wanted to record, where I wanted to go who I am as an artist, like what my voice is, what my vision is, like what's the trajectory we want to go on moving forward. And it gave me an opportunity to get all the back end of the business together and kind of get everything in place so that when we did open back up, whenever that was, because we didn't know, yeah. uh, we'd be ready to like hit the ground running. And uh, I definitely think that those two years were 
were definitely instrumental in uh, getting everything together. I mean, we we recorded a record, we did uh, a bunch of bunch of video content, bunch of stuff like that, and it uh, it really helped move things forward a lot behind the scenes and some some in the spotlight as well. Um, so that when we came out of it, it would just be like, cool, this is what we're doing. This is where we're going. Right. And so the new record is good things. Was it an exciting process or was it more just let's get back into it? Let's get back into the groove. Let's do this. Let's start making music and more of just switching back into that artist's mind of let's get going. I think it was a bit of both. It was really exciting because I think on this record and this batch of songs, especially, we really found the groove of what it what it is i am as an artist the sound the production styles that we want to use and spencer justin and i spent days sitting in the studio trying different things working on different stuff and just like messing around with different sounds trying different ideas and and we had all of these visions of these different sounds and different things we'd like to bring together and then it was like finding a way to make them work together to create the sound that is kind of like everything that my life has been brought together into one and so it was a really exciting process because when you finally like hear that sound or hear like the start of something coming to life and you're like, I've never felt this way about a recording before. And so that was a really cool thing. And then it was the whole releasing it. And it's like, that's a nerve wracking thing, especially when it's a little bit of a new sound, a little bit of a departure from what I had done previously, because before it was kind of like, we're like throwing darts at a board and we're trying to get different things. Right. It's like, I feel like we've hit the bullseye here, but is anybody else going to think that? And in a sense, I didn't really care because it's like, well, this is what I am. This is what I want to sound like. This is what I sound like. Right. Uh, some people will like it. Some people will hate it. Hopefully it doesn't make them feel nothing because if they love it, they'll talk about it. If they hate it, they'll talk about it. So. <laughs> Thank you once again so much for listening and thank you to Devin for stopping by and sharing his story. Be sure to check out his new EP, Good Things, wherever you stream your music. Please also be sure to check out our website, countrymusicmademe.com. There you can listen to all of our episodes and also sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive content and stay up to date on all of our upcoming guests. Just head over to countrymusicmademe.com and hit that subscribe button. You can also find us on any streaming platform. So if streaming is your thing, just head over to your favorite, search Country Music Made Me, and give us a follow there as well. Thank you once again so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on Country Music Made Me. Music